This is World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment with your host, Carl Gruber. World Awakenings is a podcast dedicated to opening your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that the world's population is now more than ever awakening to all things spiritual, metaphysical, and enlightening, and just how they play an all important role in our daily life. So join Carl on this enlightening experience as he interviews metaphysical and spiritual experts to discuss, debate, and delve deeply into the hows and whys of this worldwide awakening. The law of attraction states that everything is energy and that like attracts like. True spirituality states that the only true reality is that of oneness, unity, and unconditional love and forgiveness. Together, these two are attached at the hip and perform a beautiful symbiotic dance together. Hi, I'm Carl Gruber, author of the brand new book, True Spirituality and the Law of Attraction, a Beautiful Symbiotic Relationship. This is a book that will show you how to build a rock-solid personal foundation based on unchanging, eternal, universal truth that shows you how to become a consistent co-creator with the universe to create the life you love to live and live to love. Get your copy today of my new book, True Spirituality and the Law of Attraction, A Beautiful Symbiotic Relationship, and learn how to manifest the life you truly desire to be living. Now available as an ebook or paperback on Amazon. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us here for yet another episode of this podcast, World Awakenings, The Fast Track to Enlightenment. I am your host, Carl Gruber, and this is episode 101, and we are going to dive deep into the amazing life story and experiences of today's guest, so stay tuned. First, please take a moment to click that link below to check out my new book, True Spirituality and the Law of Attraction, a beautiful symbiotic relationship, a book that will help you to build a rock-solid foundation for your life and become a consistent co-creator with the universe to live the life you love and love the life you live. Now available on Amazon as an ebook or paperback. All right, today we are checking in with Barbara Doust. She is an acclaimed success mindset strategist, business growth accelerator, author, and inspirational speaker. Barbara shows entrepreneurs, business owners, and individuals how to play a bigger game, overcome their uh, upper limits, and achieve their biggest dreams and goals. Boy, that is so much needed by everybody. Yeah. Barbara spent most of her career in theater, arts, film, and television as a director, acting coach, writer, and producer. Her search for consistently dramatic and lasting results led her to become a certified thinking into results consultant with with Proctor Gallagher Institute. That is very cool. She now blends her 25 years of acting, directing, and writing experience, inspiring people to build a more successful self-image using their imagination, spiritual laws, and business principles. And she's also author of the book, True Love, True Self, A Journey to Self-Love. Both Barbara and myself are fortunate to be life coach graduates of Christy Whitman's Quantum Success Coaching Academy. And with that, welcome, Barbara. I'm so grateful to have you on the show. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Well, and, you know, speaking of uh, Christie's Quantum Success uh, Coaching Academy, Christie is uh, on episode number 100 and a couple others, actually. And, you know, you and I just met uh, a couple of weeks ago when Christy had a master, a QSCA master class. And, and you know, we Christy went around the room and uh, each of us who were guests as uh, graduates shared our personal stories. And yours just really intrigued me. I, I'll tell you, you, you've got quite a story to tell about your life up to this point in time. You, you, your previous career was quite different than what you do now. You were involved in the world of acting and entertainment, right? That's right. And in what in what aspect? I mean, how did how did that a girl, a young woman from Montreal, Canada? How did you end up working <laughs> in the, the industry, in entertainment industry, in Hollywood? 
You know, I think that it's always fascinated me as well. Uh, I was born and I was born to express as Mm -hmm. we all are. Right. And I just, um, I didn't know why, but I wanted to be like Shirley Temple. That was my generation. (laughs) That, That was it. You know, and I, and one of my very first memories was, I recall jumping up and down on my bed at five years old, screaming, I want to be an actress. If I'm not an actress, I want a doggy. (laughs) <laughs> you know, so those were like my demands. Those were like my desires. And I was in a family that couldn't understand any of this because, I mean, my father's one of 14 children. My mother was one of six children. And um, out of everybody, I was the only so-called artist in the mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. So n- nobody really understood me or what was going on. But I, um, I was in every school play. And I was, you know, banging at the principal office door asking for acting teachers and acting classes. And and eventually I just gave up. And in high school, I directed the school play and created the drama club. I was just obsessed. Mm -hmm. I was obsessed. I even remember I I was 12 years old and I had uh, I wrote out a contract and had my parents sign it. And on the contract, it stated that by the time I was 13, they would send me to acting school. Mm -hmm. I turned 13 and they denied that the contract ever existed because they were just like, let's, you know, let's not focus on this. You know, we don't know what to do with this one. We don't have the money to put her into acting classes, let alone there aren't any acting classes for her to go to, Mm -hmm. you know? So I was just always um, on a quest. I mean, I, directed the variety show and and I choreographed and I did everything I could singing I sang all the time and all I heard most of the time was shut up couldn't understand why I understand now why you know but so I just had this fantasy of being in um in in Hollywood you Uh know and I think as a kid what's ironic to me is that so I I ended up going to college and majoring in theater, but I became a little bit more so-called realistic and logical as everybody was saying, you can't make any money. And uh, so I certified as a uh, specialist in drama in education. And I taught creative dramatics in the school system for a good 20 years. And I remember even when I went to, I moved to San Francisco, I taught over 25 drama classes a week in the school systems. I was a California Arts Council um, artist in residence. I was the only one in the greater Bay Area selected to, you know, teach drama, uh, creative dramatics, so to speak. But um, I very soon in my 20s discovered that acting uh, was somewhat challenging. I didn't have the mindset for it. I didn't have the skin, the tough skin for it. Um, It was challenging to receive feedback, criticism. Um, I'm a recovering perfectionist. And also, I didn't like, I'm part of the Me Too generation. So at that time, there was really a big, um, a big gap between the, um, the role of men and the role of women in, in the business. So I put my emphasis and my focus on uh, directing. And then I moved to San Francisco with my husband at the time, and we founded a theater company. I did do a little bit more acting, but again, I felt, you know, that um, I was, you know, I wasn't being treated seriously as a smart human being for some reason. It was like there was no brain between these ears. And I didn't like that feeling. And I didn't like the way I saw directors treating actors. You know, I just didn't like the, um, uh, it was almost emotionally abusive, in my opinion, and in my experience. So I decided I would become an actor's director and, you know, just really support the actor in their creative process. And I felt more comfortable there. I felt more um, powerful there. I also felt really excited about pulling performance out of people. And that's what I do. I pull performance out of people. And then I, I had a show that went to the Kennedy Center. And I was, I wasn't even 30 years old yet. And, um, but I was paid a big whopping $400 to, oh, wow. 
you know, t- for a theater company that paid me $400 to direct the show. And then when I, I came back from the Kennedy Center, um, they asked me to direct again. And I said, not for $400. And they said, how much? And I said, 800. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And, and they said, well, we're going to have an emergency board meeting. They called an emergency board meeting, came back to me and said, 750 is our bottom line. So I, I directed it and it went on to a huge hit, you know, extended run, sold out performances, fan mail. And they never asked me to direct again because I broke precedence and made more than $400 as a director at that theater. And I went, something's wrong with this picture. There's, you know, maybe I need to uh, become a professor so I can have some steady income. And then uh, I, so I decided to apply to UCLA to get my master's in directing, which I did. And they select three people a year. And, um, and I had the intention at that time to seek failure and to really mess up my work to get really, really messy. And I did, I, I succeeded at that. <laughs> so, so, so I had the intention. I really wanted to, I was what's considered an unconscious competent. And I knew that my work was really tidy and I was obsessive and I was perfectionistic and I was just hanging on to every picture being perfect and, you know, and, and just, you know, digging and digging and digging and digging until it was just, you know, the optimal result. Um, but with that comes a lot of pressure, anxiety, um, you know, not good enough. It was just really feeding the, it's never going to be good enough. So I decided that um, my theater company could have grown so much more had I done, uh, had I played politics more, had I let go of control a little bit more and surrendered. And um, and also one of the biggest challenges I ever had, because I grew up always doing for myself, you know, because most people didn't understand what I was trying to do. Then the whole issue was asking for help. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't very good at asking for help, which didn't allow my theater company to grow to the level it could have, right? Um, from the politics in gr- grant raising, you know, fundraising to a- using other people's money and all of that kind of that you need for expansion. So when I went to UCLA, I thought I, I really want to play politics, learn how to do that you know, and allow myself to fail. So I deliberately selected a lot of productions that I didn't even understand and they were confusing and they were absurdist or they were avant-garde or they were off the charts, you know, um, incomprehensible, really. And uh, or like 30 people in in a production and really having no idea of of, uh, what to do. But I just chose that I would find out what to do. Right? Because I was a pre-planner and pre-planning to me just fed my control issues. I needed to be in control. I needed to be in control because I felt too vulnerable, you know, being um, open. And that led to, you know, a series of really bad productions and almost being thrown out, kicked out of the program at UCLA. So you literally set yourself up for failure because you needed, you knew you needed to fail in order to learn more. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Well, how did you recover from those failures then? Then you went on to, to direct some, some hits. Well, what happened was um, then I was in my, I think at the end of my second year, I did three years at UCLA in the end of my second year, Again, I selected a production that was going to be very challenging. It had a cast of 40 people. Uh, we were limited in our set design. It was an exercise. and uh, But it went on to be one of the biggest hits in UCLA history. Oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. And, yeah. And people were... Uh, bouncing off the box office windows. The, the box office personnel had to hire security. They had to shut the blinds. They were turning away 100 people a night. They hired security at every entrance of the theater. People were crawling into the theater, you know, and watching the show underneath the bleachers. And and then as a result of that, I went on to win director awards, scholarship awards, and for my thesis production, got every, everything that I asked for. What, what was the name of that play? So it was Lysistrata, a Greek classical oh. comedy. 
Oh, wow. This is great. You know, I, I want to go back, though, to when you were a five-year-old jumping up and down in the bed yelling, I want I want to either be an actress or I want a dog. And your parents are quick, going, quick, get her a dog. <laughs> <laughs> got a dog right away. But but also a recovering perfectionist. So So being a perfectionist can be a hindrance. Absolutely. It's crippling. Hmm. You know, I think that it works and can work up to a point. You know, it's really about what is it that you want and what are your desires and do you even have an awareness of where you're going? I didn't even have an awareness of the work that I do now with people is really all about setting goals and, and achieving and accomplishing those goals. I didn't know that I... um I, that I could set goals. All I knew was I had a desire to do the next production. So I kind of lived my life going, what's next, you know, and then creating it and then feeling a vacuum and then wanting to create again and then feeling a vacuum. So I call that the lifestyle of a freelancer versus the, you know, having the mindset of an entrepreneur yeah. where there's direction or there's vision. I mean, my vision was that, um, you know, it, it never was that I would have a Broadway production. My vision was more that I would become a regional theater director across the country. But when somebody told me that there was not a lot of money in that and they advised me to, to do it differently, then I thought maybe teaching would be a steady income and I'd be able to create. But here's the thing, Carl. After I graduated, I applied to over 250 universities across the country and I did not get one reply. What? <laughs> well, now, so is that lack of respect for the theater by, by um, the educational institution? Well, no, I think what was happening were, was that the theater departments were diminishing in size. Oh, okay. And I think that there was such a stronghold on tenureship, mm. right? But mm. it was one of the biggest gifts in my life for that to happen. Um, I, I spent a year in the hallway, you know, not knowing how to design my life, not knowing that I could be a co-creator, not knowing that I had, you know, the ability to create the life I wanted. I had, I was just a victim of circumstance and conditions, right? That I was always living from the outside in seeking approval outside myself. And, um, which served me on, you know, up to a point. Uh, but I was in a mindset of defending being a struggling artist and being limited by my art, you know, financially and making it work as best as I could in order to survive as an artist. Everybody else had gone on to other careers, you know, in my college. And But what did happen, which was very bizarre, um, I spoke with a producer at UCLA and, and said, I just can't get arrested. I, I can't get a job anywhere. Nobody. And I've got a show at the Kennedy Center. I've run a theater company. I have a master's. I've got all this success and uh, nobody's replying. And he said to me, I want you to go see the psychic. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, what's that about? You know, and uh, but I was that desperate yeah. you know, at the time. So I went to see this psychic that he recommended and uh, because I really regarded and respected this teacher, you know, and he was a producer and a working producer in the business. And, um, and the psychic kept saying, there's two girls in your life. There's two girls in your life. And I'm like, no, there are no girls in my life. I have no children and I don't have girls in my life. And she kept insisting that I had two girls in my life. And, um, and I was, and I walked away from it just going, well, that was a, a lost case, uh -huh. a, lost, a lost cause. And uh, two days later, I got a phone call to interview to be the acting coach, the Olsen twins. Oh, I see. Wow. And so they were seven years old at the time. Yeah. But when I reflect on it, what's really interesting about the link about this little five-year-old girl screaming, I want to be an actress she ends up in Hollywood coaching the two most famous kids in Hollywood. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a beautiful connection. So while we are uh, speaking to uh, Barbara Doust, uh, she's an amazing life coach, uh, um, amazing uh, entertainment director uh, from in Hollywood. Now, I've probably seen you walk down the red carpet at some point at some premiere here. So, but uh, I'm sure you've done that before. But 
Let, let's move forward here because Barbara, you know, when I first met you on uh, Christie's masterclass, uh, your story was amazing. You, you definitely had a big transition. Now, now in your book, uh, True Love, True Self, you relay your story of some really deep life changing losses in your life. And would you care to be able to talk about this crucial time in your life and how it changed the course of your life? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think what I was doing was on a trajectory. I really wanted to cross over in film and TV and direct in film and TV and not theater. And so I directed the girls animated series. I directed one of their music videos. And I really thought that that was where I was going. Mm -hmm. And then um, two months before my 25th wedding anniversary, my husband, Patrick, uh, was diagnosed with fourth stage lung cancer. He was diagnosed on May 5th and gone three weeks later on May 31st. Oh, wow. So this was when they say the rug was pulled out from under your feet. Yeah. You know, that or, or when the ship capsizes, whatever wet metaphor there is, you know, this was um, to hell and back, you know, where I just uh, was beside myself because all my value was connected to my other half. You know, we had been kind of joined at the hip since we were 19 years old. Wow. And um, he was my support system. And he was the person who believed in me the most. And I really discovered and I say, oftentimes that, you know, I lost the love of my life to find out I didn't really know how to love myself. Mm, yeah. And that started that journey. And just as I started to, because for a year I disappeared, I shut down my, I had an acting academy where I have a, a lot of young uh, professional actors that are now big stars in, you know, in Hollywood, but I shut it all down. I shut down my, my coaching practice. I shut down my academy and I even stopped working um, on film and TV sets. I just was too vulnerable. Um, and then you know, I, I had the wind, my the, the curtains in my living room closed for over a year. Wow. And I really, uh, I had no tools. I had never been depressed in my life. I didn't know what depression was. Never been in therapy. I had never been in counseling. I, I, none of that was available to me in my consciousness even. Um, and then a year as, as I started to breathe again and open, you know, the doorway to life, um, I found my late husband's mother dead in her apartment. Mm. And that spiraled me back into grief. And then not long after that, my father was diagnosed with lung cancer and gone a couple of months after that. And then um, one of my best friends was diagnosed with cancer and she was gone two months later. And then the the last experience was my 40 year old brother-in-law jumped out of a plane. He was the instructor and somebody who was diving with him. The two of them died because the parachute didn't open. And that made headline news. And then my cat died. And I was just like, bam, 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 slam, 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 whack, you know? And uh, so I really, I spent a good, I would say Carl, five years investigating you know what had happened or uh, you know the big question is why me um and then and defending that i had been you know a good person my whole life and what was this all about so i did go on a journey and the biggest question that i kept asking was why is change so complicated why is change so difficult why is change you know um just you know turning over a new leaf so challenging for us. And then that's when I went on a road of discovery where I went into a spiritual psychology program and a master's program. And it was all just to heal myself. I had no intention of coaching. Um, and then I discovered Christy in the Quantum Success Coaching Academy. It was her very first year. And, uh, and again, no intention of coaching, just had the desire to find out what had happened and how could I heal? And it was through Christie's work that I, I saw change occurring where I may, you know, have a day where I smiled. <laughs> yeah. You know? And then when I started working with people, because we had to work with people, right. To certify, then I started seeing results in them and the feel good, you know, hormone that I got 
you know, and helping others now feel better and feel their self-worth. And it became a passion of mine because I recognize that this recovering perfectionist or the perfectionist in me that, you know, was always pushing for more and, and not acknowledging the achievements along the way, that it became really, really important to me and a mission to help people discover their self-worth and their self-value. And I often say to people, you know, if only I knew then what I know now, you know, because I, in 2013, after Christy and doing some work there, I met Bob Proctor and went into another certification program, the thinking into results program that you mentioned. And I really was blown away by some concepts that I had never learned anywhere else and the importance of these concepts. And it became really my, my passion to, elevate people into their self-worth and self-value because had I really understood my true value at the time that I was working on these sets, um, I probably would be retired because I would have negotiated a much better deal. <laughs> well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, the fact that you got to uh, do something, even meet Bob Proctor, he's a fellow native uh, Canadian like That's you. That's right. That's right. And unfortunately, Bob uh, passed away um, a little while ago, but God, boy, did he bless the world. But, yeah. but but so really this transition, this five year period through this amazing grieving process and losses, uh, even your cat, you know, I mean, the last my last cat that I lost, I cried like a baby. So, I, you know, I mean, compared to losing a human, uh, it, it's something else. But you went underwent a huge paradigm shift. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It really woke me up to um, it's time to create on the inside, you know, and stop seeking approval outside and taking 100 percent responsibility for my life. And and even with, you know, the thinking into results program, the, the big aim is to go after a goal or a dream or desire that you don't know how to do. And that's kind of what I was doing when, you know, in my first and second year at UCLA, I was going after something I didn't know how to do. I just didn't realize that that was what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, it, you know, then the universe starts to conspire and starts to bring to you, you know, because you've made a decision and you start to, you know, grow the desire and the emotional connection with it. And once you do that, through repetition of the idea and implanting in the subconscious over and over and over again, this is what you want. This is what you want. This is what you want. Then things start to appear, people, places, circumstances, events start to show up. And then when things start to look really exciting, that's when the old self says, no, 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 we're not having any of this. And the paradigms start rushing in, right? The programs, the patterning, the belief systems. And, but the way it shows up in the work that I do with people, it shows up like the refrigerator breaks down and you're, you get a flat tire and, you know, your yeah. daughter just was hit with a football in the face and, you know, all these things in order to take you back to the familiar, back to what, you know, back to if defending your misery or defending your I, you know, I have a lot of clients, they start out defending their limitations. Uh -huh. So, you know, and, but I never understood the concept of without a goal, without a, a bigger, you know, plan, most people are lost. We're just living life as, you know, the spaghetti is, you know, being thrown at the wall and seeing what sticks and understanding that when these paradigms come up, this is the opportunity to change them. This is the time to investigate the origin of the belief or, you know, you don't have to therapize. You don't have to, you know, dig deeper and, and unroot, you know, all of the um, root causes, but to just acknowledge that, huh, this is trying to stop me and this is trying to stop me and this is trying to stop me and then navigate a roadmap and a plan to, you know, get into action, into the next step, into creating what I refer to as a new self-image so that it becomes a new self-identity, right? So it's going, it's the battle between the old self and the new self. And so whenever we're stretching, that's the pain I was experiencing at, at UCLA. It was painful, you know, but I was willing to do it. And I say to people, are you willing to change? Because with change comes complication. It's really messy in the beginning, right? And then it's, it's just like, 
or, or messy in the middle, I should say, you know, the beginning is kind of like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm game for this. This is good. Uh-huh. This is exciting. And then it gets really messy because everything in the neural pathways in the brain are trying to hold on to those grooves of familiarity, of patterning, of programming, you know, but when you say bye-bye, no longer, you're no longer serving me. I'm not going to be in agreement with that anymore. I have a different point of attraction. Mm-hmm. You know, so I've studied neuroscience for the last eight years and, and I'm a brain geek about, you know, because I can't go into the, the world of faith or spirituality without understanding nanos and quarks and the whole mechanism b- behind quantum physics. And when I put the two of those together, that's why I say the combination, you know, of spirituality, business principles, you know, it and imagination, because everything is created through the imagination and the power of the imagination. And that's where I bring a lot of my directing and acting experience back in because I help people embody in their bodies, mm-hmm. you know, the acting as if concept. People will say, fake it till you make it is, you know, just an awful feeling. And I'm like, yeah, well, you're faking it anyway, because you're telling yourself lies about who you are. <laughs> Wow. You know, so why not, you know, why not put in a future memory of who you're becoming and start owning that part, that vibration, that frequency versus the limited one that keeps defending, you know, what you already know. And so in that landscape of what you already know, you know, that's where you're faking it. Well, you know, I love this. We're talking to Barbara Dows, the brain geek, <laughs> which is great. But, you know, everything you say here is spot on. I especially like the the fact when you went back to, and this happened with me also, when we were budding life coaches going through the certification program, we were required to do, at least I was, I think, 70 hours of one-on-one life coaching with with uh, clients. And, and what you gave, gave out, to that client comes back to you. This is one of the things that I have learned is that you can't, whatever you give is given back to you, sometimes a hundredfold. And and people don't understand this, especially when they're saying cruel things or being judgmental and it eventually comes back. But when you're kind and loving and serving, that also comes back to you. This is one of the beautiful laws of the universe. As you give, so shall you receive. Um, but you know, your, your life is interesting in that you've, you've, you have like these phases, you know, growing up being, a um, you know, wanting to be an actress, becoming a director and, and working in Hollywood and, and a student, and then going through that huge grief pro, uh, process at that time. And, and now, you know, you're one of America's top life coaches, especially in the fields of business and entrepreneurship. How did you find this niche uh, uh, working for you? You know, I started um, when I was working with Bob Proctor and uh, we were trained to, you know, work with everybody, essentially. And what I saw was that really who I work with are professionals who have tremendous creativity and greatness within, but are frustrated with under earning. Mm hmm. Because that's who I was. You know, when I really examined picking a niche, it was really who was I before I knew this work and before I became more entrepreneurial, more of a business person, because I had lived my life as never, I was always self-employed. And as I said, I was a freelancer, which meant I was just living gig to gig to gig to gig. I wasn't controlling or navigating as much as I was waiting for opportunity not creating opportunity. And then I saw the distinction, the difference between the freelancer and the entrepreneur. That meant now as a coach, who was I being as an entrepreneur and a business builder? And I started seeing that there were a lot of people, um, you know, who had similar experiences, similar conditioning, similar backgrounds. And it all kind of led to the entrepreneurial space and small business space. So I work with a lot of financial advisors. They have their own business, but they're working within, you know, the confines of an organization, let's say. 
So people from Wells Fargo or um, Morgan Stanley, New York Life, World Financial Group, and they all have these goal setting, you know, uh, requirements. And um, and this program, Thinking Into Results, is really about goal achievement. So I was like, who are the people who are you know, really going after big goals or big dreams. And so like uh, uh, lawyers, lawyers who have their own businesses, you know, or lawyers who have a firm that they're starting. I work with marriage family therapists, a lot of therapists who uh, suffer from their own self-criticism and their own inner critic and their you know, their perfectionism. So it's like a lot of perfectionists, but the gap is between where they are and where they want to go, which is they want to make more money. Mm -hmm. And they know that their value is a lot higher than what they're receiving. They just don't know how to get there. And they don't know that what's in the way is their self-image. It's mm-hmm. a limited self-image. And so, uh, you know, and a lot of entrepreneurs from like moving uh, truck industry to uh, writers and producers I work with, um, other coaches and consultants. So they're all in the space of, even with actors, Carl, I tell actors, you've got to create this life as a business. Mm-hmm. Because if you're not in charge and navigating and, you know, creating the roadmap or the plan, you know, you become the victim of rejection of, you know, just uh, not even seeing opportunity, not creating opportunity, not creating relationships. And that's all a part of entrepreneurship and, and developing your, your career as a business owner. Yeah, they become almost like a, a ship in in the water with no rudder and, and just uh, at the mercy of the waves, knocking them around. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, that's, you know, that that's really interesting, too, because, you know, I have found as, as a, a coach, a life coach myself, that when I work with clients, one of the biggest issues is lack of self-worth, afraid to go for their their highest dreams. And that's because, I mean, I think it sounded like this happened to you even growing up with the, your desire to be an actress. It gets pounded out of us by by family and teachers and, and society because many people, you know, they haven't achieved their dreams. Well, why should you? And so they try to pound it out of you. One of my one of my mottos is, and when I work with a client is, I call it unleashing your inner champion. And, and it takes some digging, but but it really is interesting. And unfortunately, this is true of most of the population in the world, a lack of self-worth. Oh, you'll never have that. Nobody in our family ever had a brand new Corvette. Nobody of our in our family ever went to college. Why should you? You know, it's hard exactly. to overcome, but that's it why is. we have people like you. Yeah. You know, what comes to mind is I worked with a financial advisor last year who he was in his fifties and he was miserable and digging a little bit deeper for his dream. He really wanted to be in a band. He had been a musician all his life, you know, but he played, he played guitar as a hobby. And um, within three weeks of doing my program, um, he was walking his dog in a park and somebody said to him, Hey, why don't you come and gig with us tonight at the local bar? Yeah. And he said, but how do you know I'm, I'm a musician? And the guy said, I, I just thought maybe you were. And within six weeks, he had already played at three gigs. And he just sent me a text that, you know, it's been six months now. And he just got his first paying gig, wow. you know, at the lakeside restaurant bar and Mm -hmm. um and he's living it you know he's and and as a result of that his workplace and he's not miserable there anymore and it's you know and and people that i think about like an hr specialist that i work with who wanted thought she wanted to become a director of Mm -hmm. hr and seven weeks into the program she said it's not what i really want i said what do you really really want and she said i want to i want a vineyard in tuscany (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And then I said, okay, let's let's aim for that. And within a week, somebody she found a, I think it was a hotel in Tuscany for three hundred fifty thousand dollars, fifteen bedrooms. Wow. And then the next week, she had a friend who was a multimillionaire who offered to fly her in his private jet to Tuscany. Oh, and yeah. not only that, it had a vineyard. 
<laughs> you know? And wow. so it's, it's really about, you know, be careful what you ask for. Yeah. At the same time, go for it, you know, and that because the dream, I say to people, the dream never die, never dies. And Bob Proctor would always say, most people tiptoe safely to their graves with their dreams buried inside. And there are many more dreams in the graveyard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, be careful what you ask for. And and it's interesting. Sometimes uh, we can uh, just even the most innocuous things can show up. I mean, this, this is just off the top of my head. I, I have a running club that I coach on Sunday mornings. And we were at a park this past Sunday. And it wasn't the usual place we met. And one of our regular runners, he doesn't normally travel anywhere. And it was miles away. And I was talking to one of the guys. And I said, wouldn't it be amazing if, if he showed up today? And literally those words came out of my mouth and there he walked out of his car. I go, really? It was just, a, I mean, that's just a tiny little example. Even Dr. Wayne Dyer one time had a great story. I heard him back when there were cassettes and I could hear his audio tape. Uh, he had to fix, uh, he was trying to replace a light bulb in his garage and in, in his house in Maui and, and the, the bulb broke off. In, in the in the socket. So he had to go get up pliers to to grab the base, the metal base of it and get it out, but he couldn't find pliers anywhere. And he was looking everywhere. And he said, I need some pliers. I want pliers. And he kept looking. And he was literally going to go get in his car to go to the, the hardware store. There on the driveway was a brand new pair of pliers laying in his driveway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's a great story. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the power that we have as creators, I think that when you start studying and understanding and and get somebody like Barbara as a life coach, you may discover some great, great things uh, within yourself that, uh, oh, right, maybe I can do this. Yeah. And I work with um, small groups now, Carl, and the groups, uh, What's wonderful about them is people inspire each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is great too. Yeah. I even have a small healing group called the power of eight and, and yeah. we had a session before I came on here and uh, we inspire each other and heal each other. So there's a lot of power, a lot of energy when you join together, but I do have this because I know that there are many people watching and listening to this podcast right now who are interested in becoming a life coach. What advice do you have for someone wanting to become a life coach? Well, I think that to understand it's uh, definitely a journey and to get aligned with, you know, what kind of coaching you want to, to, to do really examine. There are programs that certify you that um, don't necessarily teach you how to coach. Right. So uh, you, I mean, you learn principles and pra practices and um, I love, um, coaching programs that have a business component, business training component. Yes, very important. So I think that that's really, really important because the challenge in, you know, I, even for myself in the beginning, my first year, uh, I did great, you know, and things started to grow. And then the challenge became sustaining. Mm -hmm. Right. And then after sustaining, it's the challenge of growing, you know, it's like, um, it's definitely an up and down ebb and flow like any business, right? But it takes a mindset of stick to itness. And really, you know, how badly do you want to serve others yes. to, to really understand that? And it's not about giving away your service for free. Because that also ends up being a trap for a lot of coaches, you know, um, it doesn't feel good to charge money for this. It doesn't feel good to charge for helping people, um, you know, so to to really get aligned with um, a, a group, you know, that understands the business of coaching. Mm -hmm. And, and you and I were fortunate to go through a program like that, that, yeah. that did teach us the business end of that. You know, I'm, I'm going to check in with you on, on this, too, because, I, you know, I was reviewing your website and you have some programs you offer. 
I'm really interested in, in a couple of them. Your genius code unlocked and your discover your greatness within. What are those programs that you that you do on uh, online? What are they about? So I work with a doctor, a cardiologist in Spain. He's in Tenerife in the Canary Islands. And we do brainwave entrainment programs. Mm. So, and do you know what brainwave entrainment is? Uh, well, training is, is, you know, you, you repetition so that, you know, a habit or, or uh, a goal is achieved just through repetition over and over. But yeah, what do you get into the alpha or the theta state? Yeah. Of- yeah. 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 So this doctor, you know, as a cardiologist has been working with frequencies for the last 30 years. Oh yeah. And in our, your genius code unlock program, what we do is we help people design um, a life script. So in the areas of your health, your wealth, your relationships, your career and spirituality and contribution to the world. So we take those categories and we lead people through a way to design this script and to stack with what's called presupposing questions. Presupposing questions are um, a technique for the brain to go looking for the answer and for you to let go of you know, the how. Mm-hmm. And then once you have this script written and it's all really, it's information about the brain and brain waves and how binaural beats work when you cross the corpus callosum of the brain and how there's a like a, a gap, which is called a following frequency response, where the affirmation, the message, the power statement has an opportunity to drop to the subconscious level. Most of the time, our conscious mind, people think that we create from the conscious mind, but that's maybe four or 5%. And neuroscience is showing that 95% is controlled by subconscious mind. So to get to the subconscious and to get the replay and the repetition to drop in is challenging because the conscious mind is creating a filter. It's in judgment all day long because it's holding on to what it knows and it's holding on for dear life. But this gap, this following frequency response is an opportunity for that new message to drop down to a deeper level. It, and it goes past the alpha. So we're in a beta state right now. Yes. Uh-huh. We're in a meditative state. We're in alpha. And if we go really deep into the next level, we're like hypnosis, we can maybe get to theta. You know, even it's challenging for um, hypnosis to get to the theta level, which is our deepest level. And then the the deepest theta is not the deepest it's a deeper deeper level but the deepest level is the delta level and in the delta level that's where we have a lot of ancestral programming and neuroscience is showing that ancestral programming can go back for six generations some people say 14 generations but they've done studies with um uh, with rats on generational uh conditioning and showing that like they did um the first generation where the rats were exposed to cherry blossoms. And then they unfortunately gave them a electric shock or something that created fear in them. Mm -hmm. And what they found in subsequent generations, up to six generations of rats, that if they put them in um, the same space with a cherry blossom, the subsequent generation would be terrified even without right. The electric shock or even without the stimulus. And um, so Delta at the ancestral program is it's very challenging for affirmations or power statements or intentions, you know, to get to that deeper, deeper level of where a lot of our core core fractures exist. And what we do is we use this brain entrainment. You write the script, you record the script in your own voice. It's a customized script. And then the doctor adds music and the brain waves. So he's inducing brainwave states. Mm -hmm. So where you're taking these messages from beta to alpha to theta to delta and back up again. And it's just, you can be listening, you know, it's important that you listen with both ears. And as you listen to it, you don't even have to pay attention. The frequencies are doing the work. The frequencies are taking the vibrations and traveling into these induced states. And you could do it while you're vacuuming. You could do it even driving. It's not it's not something that like hypnosis where you, you know, you can't be driving and doing other things. Um, so it's where frequencies are doing the work. And we've done work with autistic people, with Parkinson's, with um, cancer, with all kinds of, you know, con- conditions, but also mindset and goal achievement. And, um, and what we're discovering again is the, it's, it's a subtle shift in energy. It's just kind of like with the work with Christy and, you know, the council and the light body work that 
what I found for myself, like I, I put in my uh, health code that I was walking four times a week. Now I'm walking seven times a week. I can't not walk seven times a week. And, and I discovered like, it was just one day that's what was happening. You know, it, it, it's, it's such a subtle, you know, transformation of, and it's done with ease and it's done with, I, I, I started to feel more joy. I started to feel more gratitude and appreciation of uh, these frequencies. It's kind of like just being washed in positivity, you know, washed in, you know, I'm in alignment with this because there's everything inside of us that's fighting against the change. So in, in the Discover Greatness Within program, we're using frequencies as well, but we're moving more into um, daily assignments and understanding how the brain works in conjunction with the mind and the higher self, because the higher self is different from the mind, right? The mind is creating from the mind it already knows. So how do you change the mind you already know? You know, how do you connect to your higher self? How do you, you know, go into a raising consciousness within you. And that's where the power of eight, the power of the mastermind, being stimulated through your imagination, listening to other people's ideas, getting help from a coach or an accountability partner. We need to shake up the world that we already know and the mind that we already have. And there are ways to do this. Wow, this this is just absolutely fascinating stuff, and and definitely uh, Barbara the brain geek just came out there. I love it, but it is all so phenomenal. That that is just great, Barbara. The, um, you know, I I really would like uh, people to take time to go find your book. I I believe you published it a while back. True love, true self, a, a journey of self love uh to self-love and i mean your story is just fascinating and you are a champion yourself in coming uh, uh through that to where you are now and and uh, we are so blessed to have you on the show today what what uh what would be the best way for people to connect to you what's your website yeah thank you for asking carl people can go to my website um barbaradoust.com and I offer a complimentary bonus play a bigger game session. And uh, in that session, I discover what people are really seeking and what they really want and help them discover what may be in the way and, you know, some solutions for that, as well as if they want to uh, maybe download a script, a life script, they can go to the success, uh, excuse me, the code of success and download a PDF on writing a life script where I ask people to get into the images and get into the feeling place because Carl, as you know, right, as a quantum success coach, that it's the feeling place that manifests the outer reality. Absolutely. It's the vibrational frequency that creates and that, you know, where there's coherence and there are people go into yo-yo, you know, um, mindset or, you know, yo-yo, they get yo-yo results because they're in it to win it. And then they hit the first obstacle and they go back and bounce back down. And then they start again and go back down. But it takes the consistency, the persistency and the the commitment, you know, uh, as a daily habitual routine to repattern and reprogram that old self and become that future self. So the code to success is where they can get the um the download and write their uh, life script. And from there, uh, if, if they want to, you know, sign up for a discovery session with me, they can do that as well. Wow, that that is just phenomenal. Everything you you uh, said today and relate to just just uh, resonated so beautifully with me and and I'm sure with uh, so many of my listeners and viewers here. Barbara Doust, and and again, your your website is barbaradoust.com, right? And yes. Doust, Doust is spelled D-A-O-U-S-T. Yes, a little complicated with all those vowels in a row. They can also, Carl, go to vibrantresults.com and see the Genius Code Unlocked. But if they go to my website, there will be links to lead them there as well. What an absolute honor to have you on the show, Barbara. I mean, I'm so grateful and I'm so glad I've gotten to know you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And likewise, Carl, it's a pleasure.
This has been another episode of World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment with host Carl Gruber, a certified Law of Attraction life coach. We welcome you to tune in to each and every episode of World Awakenings as we open your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that the world's population is now, more than ever, awakening to the truth of all things spiritual, metaphysical, and enlightening, and just how much they play an all-important role in our moment-to-moment daily life. Much love and light to you, my friend, and thank you for tuning in to World Awakenings. Thank you.